Prince Street is brought to you by Dean and DeLuca, purveyors of the finest food since 1977. With over 40 stores around the world, Dean and DeLuca curates the best ingredients for life. It's your birthday. I have no clue how to make a cake. Cake instructions are everywhere. Books, cake. Internet, cake. Instagram, cake. Hey, it's a croque en bouche. Yours might be a Duncan Hines, but I'm gonna try for something bigger. Can I do it? Maybe. But cake risks are always good risks. Sure, there's greater chances to take than this one. We'll talk about those too. But for you, I'll always try for cake and love the risk of getting one onto the table. Blow out your candles. Welcome to Prince Street. I'm Howie Kahn, and on this episode of Prince Street, we asked some of the most interesting people in the food world to tell us about a moment in their lives when they took the riskier path. The extraordinary chef Eric Repair talks with Jay McInerney about writing his first memoir, 32 Yolks, out this month. I'm supposed to make a hollandaise, and the stove is too hot. My muscles are not strong enough. I cannot uh, whisk the 32 yolks. They start to coagulate. It's a, it's a disaster. And when Mile End's Noah Burnamoff quit law school and bought a cheap meat smoker, he never imagined one day he'd be summoned to cook for the new Prime Minister of Canada and almost blow it. We got to smoke meat to the event by 6.01, and I had to convince security that my 40-pound camo Ooh. bag Ooh. of hot, steamy, foil-wrapped stuff. I had to convince them that they should just let me through. Sierra Tishgart reports on the big gamble two editors are taking by launching print food magazines aimed at gay men. Out Magazine described it as mashup of butt and bon appetit. So we have photos in the first issue that feature a hot dog variation that is um, filled with a pickle. So for our point of view, that's about as gay as it gets. Ever wonder why you can't bring home that giant bag of truffles from Italy and where it goes when you try to? Pavia Rosati finds out from the people and the beagle who stop you. And later, an American soldier tells us why she went back to Afghanistan to help the women there, one saffron flower at a time. All that and this month's great restaurant pick from Eden Eats NYC. Don't go away. Officer Armstrong, where mm-hmm. are we going now? Just follow your nose. We're headed down a fluorescent lit hallway, deep behind the scenes at U.S. Customs at JFK International Airport. Leading the way is Sergeant Jim Armstrong, a supervisor in the Agricultural Department's K-9 unit. I've never been here before, though I've come through this terminal countless times. Two kilos of black truffles. Four dozen walnuts from my friend's tree on the Amalfi Coast. A six-pound wheel of pecorino from my favorite Bottega and Spoleto. None of it wound up here. I'm a food smuggler, and I've never been caught. When I'm not reporting for Prince Street, I'm running Fathom, a travel website, which means I get to spend a lot of my time overseas. And I like to get to know cultures through their food. If I taste something I like, I want to bring it back home. But sometimes those foods are forbidden. I know this because the U.S. Customs form that I filled out tells me so. And yet, I do it anyway. Really, I rationalize, what's so harmful about that little hunk of salami? So I decided to go to the source, U.S. Customs at John F. Kennedy Airport, to learn why, exactly, these foods I love are forbidden. On the end of the hallway is the grinder room, where all confiscated food from all corners of the globe ultimately goes to die. The grinder is a hole in the center of a table that's waist high and about 10 feet by 5 feet. It is covered in stuff. Piles of mangoes, avocados, parcels of raw meat wrapped in plastic, wrapped in newspaper, wrapped in thick tape. 
a kilo of gorgeous, glistening jamón ibérico. What's before me looks like a dream supermarket, and I want to take home everything. You're not just having a big Cuban cigar, Italian uh, cheese party with all the stuff that you seize? No. Everything is going there is going to be disposed of in such a way that it will not cause a risk to American agriculture. By my logic, if I can buy it in a supermarket and eat it in Rome, why can't I bring it home and eat it in New York? What's the difference? Well, it's not about what I'm eating. It's about what I could be carrying home with me. They're here to protect American agriculture, the trillion-dollar industry, from its greatest threat, the foreign pests and animal diseases that have cost $138 billion in annual economic and environmental losses. So really all of this is gonna happen from like one little footprint of dirt or one innocent little juicy mango from Brazil? All it takes is one. Say a fruit fry with a mango gets to Florida. They reproduce and proliferate very quickly. That's Sergeant Ellie Scaffa of Customs and Border Patrol. What if it gets to Hawaii or California? Citrus, avocados, olives. Can you imagine the industry? Hawaii, forget it. So the way that mad cow disease just decimated the English beef business and it impacted Europe, we were able to protect in this country yes. from that. Correct. Partly because of the work that you oh, do. Oh yeah, when that was happening, uh, I, was, uh, I was low on the totem pole and I had to stand there at the British flights and stand and ask each passenger to put their feet in a special solution that kills any diseases that would be attached with the soil that they walked on the farm on. Smugglers are caught through a multi-step process that includes passenger declarations and verifications by officers, inspectors, an x-ray machine, and an intrepid Beagle Brigade. We chose Beagles in the beginning because of just by their nature. They're non-aggressive. They love people. They have an incredible food drive. They're taught five odors in the beginning, apple, orange, mango, beef, and pork. From those five odors, after they're deployed in the field for about a year, they'll turn that into a hundred odors. Passengers have four chances to reveal smuggled food. These officers, in other words, are not out to get anyone. But once incurred, the fine is $300, $500 if you're a repeat offender. Who is typically smuggling in the food that shouldn't be smuggled in? The range is large, from people that innocently don't realize that there could be a problem with it, to uh, someone who definitely does. A lot of people aren't honest. Or a lot of people, believe it or not, can't read or write. The folks coming from the country would probably be bringing in more of their own food, their cooked food. Because they want a symbol of home? Right, or they're bringing that as a gift. Grandma salami or grandpa's famous recipe. Or Do wealthy passengers come through and say, I'm a billionaire, the laws don't apply to me, I can bring all the Cuban cigars I want? What's happening now is we have the global entry kiosk, and a lot of them, even though they're trained that they're not allowed to bring this, they have to declare what, even money, whatever it is, they're just saying they have nothing. They walk out the door, the bags come down on the carousel, and what happens, the Beagle Brigade comes along, sniffs the bag, sits, gets a treat, the canine officer finds out if there's any food in the bags, gets sent to agriculture, and we find the food. Hey, you didn't declare. I didn't have to declare, I'm global entry. So. They get a fine, too, and then they get thrown out of the global entry system for lying. That would be worst of all, at least for me. Losing global entry means I could no longer whisk through the lines at immigration with my pre-approved safe flyer status. We are in the agriculture inspection area, so once something is flagged in need of secondary inspection, this is where it comes. I watch Sergeant Scaffa inspect a box of food that an elderly lady has lovingly packed. She's trying to determine what the protein substance in the homemade dumpling is. Scaffa folds her arms and flaps them like wings. Do you speak English? A girl in their party steps in yeah. to translate and says that it's soy. Ah, uh, okay. This can pass. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, no problem. And, okay, as much as it killed me, to watch the Hamoni Berico and Grenadilla literally go down the drain, I have to say, at the end of the day, I'd been converted. I have seen the light. I am officially a reformed smuggler. I now understand that there are real risks in those innocent food mementos. 
So from now on, I'll stick to the safe foods, to spices and fig jam and wine. And when I want salumi, I'll just buy them at the market. Noah Burnamoff has been called the Bagel King of New York for his black seed bagels. And the lines are still long at his hit restaurants Mile End Deli and Grand Army. He recently told me about what he considers risky and how he got started smoking meat that's so good, even heads of state have to have it. It was a fateful evening, my second year of law school at Brooklyn Law. I just had a moment during exams. I was looked at myself, I was like, this is what I want to be doing with the rest of my life. So I'm originally from Montreal. I really missed the good vibes of Montreal delis. I convinced myself that I should try my hand at making smoked meat. So to me, it was, you know, my decision was actually not the risky decision. I saw it as life affirming, and I thought that was less risky than remaining in school and risk losing the, the opportunity to change my life situation when the time was right. So I bought a smoker, a very rudimentary one. It's made by Weber. It's called the Smoky Joe. Then you go to the butcher shop and you buy yourself some brisket. It's kind of the only way to practice. Yeah. And then you go to the grocery store and you buy a slew of different spices. What spices? Black pepper. A lot of black pepper. Coriander, Mm -hmm. paprika, dry rosemary, dry thyme, uh, mustard seed, dill seed, fennel seed, clove star anise on top of that there's salt and there's sugar so it's not simple it. it's, yeah it's, it's not, not like a, you're just dumping these things on a brisket yeah, it, throwing it in a smoker and you're done it's, it's coming up with the right blend of how much you know mustard seed versus how much paprika you want to have in your mix and then how much to actually put on the meat how long to then let it all sit together and cure moving it from the cure to the smoker the length of time that you let it smoke for and then finally how long do you then steam it for? Because unlike barbecue brisket, where you basically consume it straight from the smoker, deli meats, in particular smoked meat or pastrami corned beef, they're cooled out of the smoker and then they're reheated by steaming for a very long time and it kind of reintroduces some moisture back into the product. Years later, Mile End's become hugely successful. A couple weeks ago, you got a, a call from a powerful individual. So we got, we got the call that uh, Justin himself is a big fan of smoked meat. He's the Prime Minister of Canada. The interesting thing about Justin Trudeau is it's a legacy. His father was very beloved Prime Minister of Canada back in the 70s, and so it's sort of a nice continuation of a political legacy that Canadians are very fond of, generally. And so the invitation was extended for us to come down to Washington, D.C. and serve smoked meat at this sort of pre-party for his state dinner with Barack Obama. Everything was going well until the morning of the event. We learned that our meat shipment had not been picked up and would therefore not be arriving on time for the event. And so we scramble. We are panicking. Joel and I are... Who's Joel? Uh, Joel Teitelman is my business partner and longtime friend. We went to high school together in Montreal, in fact. We convinced one of our managers, Nora, a real superhero, to get on a train with 40 pounds of smoked meat. The box of meat actually broke. That 40 gave pounds way. of meat on the sidewalk? Luckily, it's vacuum sealed. And it was right outside of this luggage store. She ran in bought a camo backpack, but it was kind of made sense because it's almost like a like a military exercise. On her back. On her back. Not wheeled. No, there were no this wheels. This is I muscle. Mean, this is pure mile end muscle, pure Canadian muscle. And we got it down to DC by three o'clock, three In hours a- ahead of the event. We got the meat over to our friend's deli who True was Patriot love. nice enough to, to uh, steam it for us. <laughs> And so, um, amazingly, we get the smoke meat to the event by 6.01, and I had to convince security that my 40-pound camo bag of hot, steamy, foil-wrapped stuff, I had to convince them that they should just let me through. And amazingly, I think once they smelled it, they knew I'd won them over with the smell. Tail end of the evening, Prime Minister kind of comes in halfway through the evening, gives a speech. Then we realize that the scrum that's surrounding the Prime Minister as he's moved from his podium on the stage to the main floor seems to be not navigating towards us. Uh Uh-oh. 
and we see the scrum heading to the exit. Uh, so Joel had strategically brought a Myelin cookbook down with him and wrote almost like this like love letter to the Prime Minister <laughs> on the inside dear flap. Justin. Of the, it basically, it was, like a, it was like a dear Justin, we love yeah. you so much, yeah. you're so beautiful. I, I actually didn't read it because I thought it was just going to be so corny and cheesy. And all he wanted to do was hand him the book and be like, here's a little taste of home. You know, you and Sophie should make some of the recipes. It'd be so much fun, whatever. I look at my partner, Joel, and he looks at me and we think to ourselves, did we just like do all this? Did we just like send Nora down on a second Amtrak to bring us 40 pounds of meat? Did I almost get pummeled by security at the front entrance to then actually miss the opportunity to encounter the prime minister? And so as we're watching the scrum m manipulate the prime minister towards the exit, Joel just takes matters into his own hands. He basically charges at the scrum. And he, amazingly, Joel gets right up to the prime minister and, and says to him, we're serving smoke meat. We know how much you love it. It would be awesome if we could just take a photo with you. My partner Noah is like right over there. And if you could just come by the table. He came over to the table and we took some photos together. When he left, he said, thanks so much, guys. I'm actually not super hungry right now. It's, it was pretty late by that point, but I promise I'll come visit you. And I was like, politicians make promises right. Right. left and right that they right. don't fulfill. We get a call a couple days later from a media outlet asking if it would be okay if they interviewed Justin Trudeau at Mile End in Manhattan. His motorcade pulls up, just cruises down Bond Street with like 12 cars, police, terrorism units, Secret Service and RCMP. And he pulls up, he walks right up to us. And the first thing he says to us is, hey boys, you see, I fulfill my promises. Love that. You can learn how to make your own smoked meat sandwich in the Milan cookbook written by Noah and his wife, Ray. I'm still shocked by how many people I meet who didn't know that James Beard was a gay guy. That's Lucas Volger, a cookbook writer and entrepreneur who co-founded Jari, one of two food magazines aimed at gay men that has launched within the past year. I'm Sierra Tishgart, reporting for Print Street. I've just been aware of how many gay guys work in food media and creating content that's largely intended for a female audience. And so through Jari, I've wanted to just have a place to explore the history of food and the contributions of gay men. I was interested in how the tone and the content and the scope of the content might change if you gave a lot of these guys um, an audience of other gay men. I want to publish stories that might have otherwise been lost. Like in its second issue, Jari has a profile of Howard Helmer, who worked as a spokesperson for the American Egg Board for over 40 years, and... He also holds the Guinness World Record for a number of omelets made in 30 minutes, which is something like 427 omelets. And he's a, a gay guy that, like, he saw all of modern gay history, like, from gay liberation through AIDS and up until he married his partner of 39 years once uh, they legalized gay marriage here in New York. So that was a story that I think probably wouldn't have been published elsewhere. I knew something like this was going to exist at some point, so if I didn't start working on it immediately, somebody else was going to do it. And that happened to actually be the case. <laughs> somebody was already working on it. He's talking about Mouthfeel, a magazine started by Mac Malachowski, who moved to New York to work at restaurants like Ma Pesh and Bar Balut. He launched Mouthfeel in April, five months before Jari. The two magazines have distinct identities, though. Jari dives into the history of food and the contributions of gay men while celebrating gay domesticity with photo spreads that evoke Martha Stewart's golden days. Mouthfeel, on the other hand, is more punky and erotic. Out Magazine described it as mashup of butt and bon appetit. We have something called the back pages. So we have photos in the first issue that feature a, a hot dog variation that is um, filled with a pickle. So for our point of view, that's about as gay as it gets. But for B Betty Crocker, Better Homes and Gardens at the time, it was a genuine appetizer when having a dinner party. I think food is a metaphor with the right lens. If you're wearing the right glasses looking at it, I mean, it can be almost anything that you want it to be. 
Mac draws inspiration from his vast collection of vintage pornography. And as a nod, mouthfeel comes wrapped in a plastic bag, making it feel a little naughty. Mac has also taken the risk of showing full frontal nudity. Uh, page 88 and 89 is a, um, a single spread. The left-hand side is a tight crop of the crotch of a uh, porn star from a magazine called Hunk, one of my favorite and most inspiring magazines from my vintage collection. Uh, page 89, the right-hand side, is a um, uh, thin crust pie with um, ample dollops of piped whipped cream. Um, without being, you know, too straightforward, I see more body parts in the pie than I do in the pornography. That's really important for me, I mean, especially to exercise the, the gay component of it. We're definitely inspired by gay magazines that have nudity in them, and uh, we're definitely inspired by food magazines that have recipes, too. It's interesting and difficult, but definitely, um, you know, inspiring to marriage the two. It is interesting having a, you know, a pretty explicitly gay publication, you know, that we can sit alongside all sorts of magazines. On one end of the spectrum, it's, you know, we're very comfortable in, obviously, gay surroundings. We're a little less comfortable in food surroundings, so um, it's interesting to see people who, like, initially subscribe to the idea, but sort of have a few roadblocks halfway through reading the publication, you know? Um, I don't want to say people are stuffy or anything, but it is something that I do notice that our audience kind of fluctuates up and down when they're excited about the idea, but they're not super excited about the visual representation of it. There's long been a culture of hyper-masculinity in professional kitchens. So I asked the editors, do you think it's a risk to come out as a gay male chef today? I don't want to say we're like, post-gender, post-discrimination, but I think it's definitely easier. Maybe an interesting way to rephrase it is, is it necessary to come out in the kitchen? Like our feature article in Jari is John Birdsall. He sort of comes to this interesting conclusion about the privilege of being able to pass. Like I was talking with the chef Stephen Satterfield, and he's a, you know, a gay guy, and he's like, all of my line chefs are like, yes, queen, when I ask for something. And it's, you know, it's just part of the culture. And it's, if you step back from that, it, yeah, it looks maybe problematic, but within the culture of it, it's, uh, it's accepted. Which leads to an interesting question. Cuisine often gets paired with identity, ethnicity, race, cultural backgrounds. So is there such a thing as gay food? Early on, when I was concepting Mouthfeel, I, I decided pretty adamantly that the only way to explore if there was a, something called gay food was to do it through the sort of eyes and mouths of gay people, right? The gay recipe that we have for this one is for, like, apricot hot wings, which is, like, maybe, like, a traditionally heterosexual dish. Um, so I think it's, it's fun to play with that idea. I don't think it has too much weight to it. The notion of, like, food itself being gay is kind of, um, I, 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 I can't like entertain that intellectual <laughs> exercise for very long. People want to call us a gay food magazine. And in that question, there's like, does the gay modify the food or does the gay modify the magazine? And so we always correct them to say, it's a food magazine intended for gay guys. <laughs> That's a challenge in itself. How do you market and sell a print magazine in this digital age? It's definitely risky, which is why I think we're finding alternate success in live events. Like we just had this wonderful event with the, the nonprofit Start Out, which they're focused on um, entrepreneurship for LGBTQ people, and um, they had never done a food event before. Even these two editors, who could easily see each other as competition, realize that there's strength to be gained in banding together. And as pioneers, they're helping to pave the way for more gay publications in food media. We're definitely, I think, supportive of each other and, um, and happy to be not this sort of like floating island without, you know, somebody we can like nod and be like, look, it's not that crazy. And I think there could be a third, fourth, and a tenth take on it too. So I would not be surprised if that was coming. Since Sierra filed her story, Jari won its first James Beard Award. Congratulations, Jari and writer John Birdsall. Now it's time for Eden Eats NYC with Eden Grinchpan. I'm standing on Great Jones Street in NoHo, one of my favorite neighborhoods, and I'm about to walk into Vic's, a Mediterranean restaurant that actually opened up two years ago with a chef, Hilary Sterling. 
Hillary does not hold back on flavor. She is bold, she is bright, she loves anchovies, chilies, garlic. Everything that you eat there has a little bit of a spice to it, and there's so much of her soul and her heart in her food. Hillary has worked for some incredibly talented chefs in the city, like Mario Batali at Lupa, Bobby Flay, and you can really see all the influence from these chefs in her food. So let's go inside and talk to her. Last time I met you, I think I like was freaking over your turnips with the pecorino cheese yeah, a little bit. I think the turnips. What are we going to be making today? Okay, we are going to be modernizing a old school recipe from my grandmother of stuffed cabbage. Do you find that there is risk in creating kind of a classic dish that people hold near and dear to their heart? We talked about this in the kitchen this morning and every cook had a different story. Everyone had what meant something to them. So yeah, there's a risk, but I'm trying to allow you to get into my head, into my family, and this is what we ate. And do you yeah. find that your family affected the way that you cook now? Totally. Eating with my grandparents was like this old school family vibe. Um, that we just didn't do. I mean, we were kids running around, we had soccer, we had this, we had that. There was never that time to sit down to eat, but when your grandparents were around, you, they, they wasn't, there wasn't an option. Yeah. Like, Grandma said, sit, you sat. So what was your grandmother like? She was, she was a super cool lady, and she liked to cook, and you ate what she cooked. You didn't ask questions. You just did as you were told. And we'd come downstairs in the morning, and she would make us these crazy leftovers for breakfast, and the smell when you came home from school was just like, uh, it, it, it brings you to like this place of, of pure bliss and happiness. There was always something cooking, like zucchini cakes, everything was a cake. Every, I mean, this is like salmon cakes. A woman cakes. after my own heart. I mean, everything became <laughs> something into a pancake or a fried thing or something, but. Well, she's being resourceful, obviously. She utilized everything. We utilize all animals, the cores of vegetables, they go into stocks and there's no waste. Did you tell her that you wanted to become a chef? Did she know She that got that to see the, um, the fun years of my earlier stages of being a sous chef and, and just when I became the chef de cuisine of Avoce. So she got to see all those things. She loved that someone else wanted to cook. Yeah, because she was doing it for so many years. So She's many like, years. you can take it, yeah. take it from me. Can't wait to see how you vixify it. Vixify our, <laughs> our old school Eastern European stuffed cabbage. Well, you know, it's the, it's like basically just like, it's, it's comfort food, obviously. Like, right. this is a dish that gets passed down from generation to generation. This is in the history of our culture. So, I mean, every culture has one. Okay, let's do this. Let's go cook. If you want to get the recipe and see us make the dish, head to livefromprincetree.com. This seems like an important story. It seems like a chance to see progress in a very scary place. That's award-winning photographer Melanie Dunay talking about why she risked traveling through Afghanistan to shoot a very special saffron harvest, one of the first of its kind, thanks to a 29-year-old former American Army captain named Kimberly Jung. Some of them do know that I was a soldier. It doesn't seem to bother any of the farmers at all. I caught up with Jung by phone from her home in Chicago, where she now runs Rumi Spice, the saffron importing company she co-founded in 2014. But five years before that, Jung was deployed to Afghanistan. Her duties there included clearing roadside bombs. And honestly, when I first got there as a platoon leader, I was scared. And I would, had a lot of responsibility on my shoulders. And it wasn't just me, you know, my whole platoon. My mission was in my mind, to like make sure that all of my soldiers stayed safe, and we completed our missions, and we got out of there, and we, you know, nobody got killed. After serving for two years, Jung returned home and enrolled at Harvard Business School. While there, she was surprised to find herself seized with an idea that would take her back to Afghanistan, this time to Herat province in the country's arid and mountainous north. Now I come back to Afghanistan, it's a totally different focus and a totally different mission, which is not about being scared, but rather about reaching out. And so reaching out to me means reaching out in an, a way of economic empowerment. And I started doing that when I was a military officer deployed there as well. I went to the nearby 
Afghan National Army base and talked with them and asked if they wanted to partner up and do missions together. And so I think that was the first time where I did start to reach out to you know, the local Afghans and try to be, instead of like an occupying force or whatever, but try to be a partner on the ground with the people who are living there. This time, Jung saw she could do that by working directly with farmers of the high-quality saffron that comes from Afghanistan. The most expensive spice in the world begins as the stigma of a crocus flower. Each stigma has to be picked, peeled, and dried. One pound of saffron requires 75,000 crocuses. That's why those tiny red threads we use in bouillabaisse and tagines cost more than gold. We started off, like a lot of startups, with our own money out of pocket. And we also did a Kickstarter campaign in June of 2014. We raised $33,000. Leased the land, we leased a facility, we bought drying machines, we bought all the gloves, the masks, the hair nets, the uniforms for the Afghan women workers. Basically all the startup costs in Afghanistan to be able to, to do this, as well as pay the workers and pay Shakur, who was our manager on the ground. Rumi Spice employed 75 women during the last harvest, which in Afghanistan is itself a risk. They're not allowed to work in the same facility as men who are not related to them. So if they do work in a facility, it has to be like all women, right? So this is why they've actually been involved in the saffron industry, because all hands on deck basically around end of October, beginning of November. And so it's really easy to like bring all the women into one area where they're like enclosed and they're safe and that their husbands and their fathers can trust that they are being taken care of by whoever is the manager, right? And so for us, that's Shakur. So in order for the women to come work at our facility, Shakur had to physically go and talk to each one of the husbands and the fathers and the brothers to ask permission for their wife or sister or daughter to be able to work in our facility and give, him, give them his personal guarantee that they would be safe. And he was even driving some of them back and forth between work, you know, making sure that they, like, made it back home. I asked Jung if dealing with the Taliban has been a problem for her, her employees, and her company. I had no idea if the Taliban was going to react in any way. Traveling to and from Afghanistan is also quite risky. You know, you elevate your profile as a foreigner. You can be a target for kidnapping. There's also a risk of the transportation part. You have to be really careful about how you ship things into and out of Afghanistan. It's a landlocked country. And the roads are not that safe at all. It's not just the Taliban, it's a lot of the other networks, the insurgent networks that are out there, the local gangs, the local, you know, hoodlums. You just kind of a wild, wild west out there. On Jung's last trip, photographer Melanie Dunay came along. The author of five books she's at work on her next, about how rare foods are produced. It's called Foods to Die For. In this case, getting the pictures proved dangerous, too. We were hidden in the back of this van, and they said to us, you know, if we get stopped, when we get stopped, just cover your face, don't look up. Sometimes there'll be a Taliban checkpoint, and you won't know if it's the Taliban or if it's Afghan National Army because the Taliban will just find uniforms that look exactly the same or are the same uniforms. And so if they know that you're an American somehow, then they will absolutely detain you and keep you, hold you for ransom or something. So this family risked their lives for us to go to this field. And we drove about an hour and a half through the absolute desert and broken down... Afghanistan that's in all of our imaginations. And we turned a corner in the middle of nowhere and the most extraordinary purple field revealed itself. Rows and rows and rows of perfect flowers and then in the distance these hard rugged mountains and my breath was taken away. I was so moved by this country. I actually cried when I left. really proud, first of all, of being able to hire 75 Afghan women who were paid direct wages directly from Rumi Spice. So that's an extra step in economic empowerment of Afghan women. Rumi Spice now has over 35 farmers in their network and exports 5% of Afghanistan's total saffron production. 
It's become the saffron of choice for chefs like Eric Repair and Dan Barber. But it seemed to me that this former American soldier was even prouder of the friendships she's made with her Afghani partners. I've been welcomed into their homes and they've, their wives have cooked dinner for me and I've played with their kids. And that is pretty much the utmost honor that anyone could give in Afghanistan. There's a term called Pashtunwali, which is their cultural hospitality, but it's to a whole nother level where they, you know, if you invoke Pashtunwali as a, as a guest, then that family is obliged to take care of you, to feed you, to house you, to make sure that you're safe from danger. For security reasons, details of Jung's next trip to Afghanistan are classified, but Jung is looking forward to heading back. To learn more about Rumi Spice and cooking with saffron, check out RumiSpice.com. Coming up, the McInerney Report. Hi, this is Jay McInerney. I'm in Midtown Manhattan, outside La Bernardin, Eric Repair's three-star Michelin restaurant. Eric is one of the most celebrated chefs in the world who trained under one of the most celebrated chefs in the world, Joel Robuchon, who's known for running a very fine and a very tough kitchen. Let's go in and talk to my friend Eric. Why did you decide to write a memoir now? It's a little bit of a legacy, of course, but I wanted to write something that could be inspirational for young people who are obviously um, interested in my industry, but also for young people who are not necessarily in, in the industry and are going to go in a professional life. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about writing the book. Well, you're working in your second or third language here and in English. I worked with Veronica Chambers, right. who writes amazing English. <laughs> So it was a collaboration. It's not like I, I sat down and at, at night, I don't know how, how you work, Jay, if you mm. work on, on the morning or at night, but you must have a ritual about writing your, your yeah, morning. novels or, or uh, books, articles. For me, it was a different process. Reading about your childhood, I, I imagined you as being a very fat kid because you just were addicted <laughs> to sweets and eclairs and apple tarts. But apparently you weren't. You were a skinny kid. <laughs> I was a skinny kid. I was a gluten. I was definitely not a gourmet. <laughs> yeah. I was eating my face off. Uh, <laughs> and everybody was very worried about diabetes, so my, my weight and so on, what would, what would happen to me. And uh, I grew up and <laughs> I think I, I ended up fine. <laughs> yeah, I think you, I think you I turned think out pretty well. <laughs> more or less. <laughs> well, of course, we all know how the story ends in one way, but reading about your childhood... I found it hard to believe that, that the kid that you described, young Eric Repair, could put up with this kind of bullshit that you, that you did <laughs> every day for years in these kitchens. At First at La Tour d'Argent, yes. and, then, and then under the legendary Joel Robichon. What do you think was your worst moment in a kitchen? There's the incident that gives your book its title, 32 Yolks. It's a, an important moment in my career. It's when I'm coming from culinary school, First day in La Tour d'Argent, I think I know how to, how to cook, so I'm going to prove myself. They gave me 32 yolks. They gave you 32 eggs. Eggs, eggs. and I, I have to separate the, the, the yolks. yolks yeah. And it takes me a long time, and they're starting to complain I'm too slow. And, and you're, then I'm you're making a hollandaise, right? I'm supposed to make a hollandaise, and the stove is too hot. My muscles are not strong enough. I cannot... Uh, uh, whisk the 32 yolks, they start to coagulate, it's a, it's a disaster, the chefs are mad, they're wondering <laughs> where I'm coming from, who am I, and it will take me months to practice to be able to make a decent and then a good Hollandaise later on, but when I achieved the 32 yolks, <laughs> Sabayon, and created the Hollandaise for the station, then I was becoming a cook. The way you describe Robuchon's kitchen, the level of anxiety and terror is, it's... it's the anxiety is very contagious. Robuchon was not a violent chef. Yeah. But we wanted to please the master because he's a true master. And it was virtually impossible. And then the stress will take you and you will really, really start to become a different person. Yeah. And uh, <coughs> as young people... 
you, you don't know everything. You have to learn the craft. And it was a very hard way of, of learning, for sure. It was a tough environment, but we were laughing a lot as well. Well, I think that one of the ways that I realized how scary and difficult working for Robuchon was, was that you were relieved when you got called up for military service. You were, and I just, I just think like, come on, this is, this is like the good news that he's getting drafted into the military? Robuchon was so challenging. And I was young, I was about 19 years old. I was about to give up, but I was not giving up because I had, mm. again, that drive. But then suddenly I received this letter and it's the military service saying I have to go. And then what astonished me was when you were almost through with your military service, somehow Robichon found, called you up, he found you, and he invited you back, and you went. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> I thought it was a joke. It was my last week being oh. in the military, and they said, uh, someone is calling you, and uh, it's Mr. Robichon. And he was offering me the chef poissonnier position, which is a very prestigious position, right, yeah. being in, in charge of cooking fish. However, I was thinking, like, I have to go back there, really? <laughs> I escaped? I have, to, I have to think about it. So I told him, I said, can I think about it? And he was very, very nice. And he said, of course you can think about it. You have 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, okay, I guess uh, I have no choice. So I said yes. And I went back. And, and I never regret it. Although it was probably the toughest two years of my life in a professional kitchen. Yeah. But eventually you did become a specialist in fish, uh, yes. poissonnier. And, yes. and you talk a little bit in the book about the difference between cooking meat and fish. I mean, is it correct to say that uh, cooking fish is more precise? Cooking fish is definitely more precise. To make an analogy, let's take a, um, a piece of snapper that you have to saute and make a sauce with it. 30 seconds extra, or maybe even 10 seconds, will totally change the fish. In a stew, let's say you make a beef stew, like a bourguignon, and you let it cook 20 minutes longer than yeah. it's supposed to, it's not, a big, matter, it's not yeah. a big deal. However, both cookings are very challenging. Yeah. It's, it's not like fish is like for the champions and cooking meat is not for the good cooks. Both cookings complete each other. Wine obviously still plays a big role in what happens here in Le Bernardin. And, um, yes. and many people are surprised that the man who's possibly the world's greatest fish chef drinks red wine with everything. <laughs> uh, do you, I have simple tests, Jay. <laughs> <laughs> but someone like you has this great knowledge and great collection of wine. And, and when you do the wine pairings, you ride on, ride on the money and... I appreciate that. Well, when I am with you, actually, I drink white it's wines. It's not and a I science. Drink, <laughs> I drink sh champagnes and I drink uh, sweet wines. That's and so true, on. yes. Uh, and I appreciate e that as yeah. well. So um, I hope there's going to be a sequel. But <laughs> it's, it's, it's so much work to write a memoir. I, I, I think I need a break. <laughs> I need to do a cookbook in between. Now it's time for our Madeleine moment inspired by the French author Marcel Proust and his passage from Remembrance of Things Past. As the narrator dips a petite Madeleine into his tea, it triggers a powerful emotional journey that takes him back to his childhood. I am Eric Ruppert, chef of Le Bernardin, and my Madeleine moment is Tartatin. Each time I see one, oh, I smell the apples caramelizing, brings me back either way into my mother's house or at restaurant Chez Jacques. My mother had a store in, in the middle of the city in Andorra and next to her was Chez Jacques, a small restaurant where Jacques was the chef and owner and he was cooking only for 20 people. His wife was in the dining room, he was in the kitchen. Jacques chose you, you didn't choose to go to Chez Jacques. When I was 10 years old, I was in a kitchen with him watching Jacques cooking and every morning he would make a tartatin for lunch, every afternoon a tartatin for dinner. And my mother was doing exactly like him, the real tartatin, which is peeling the apples, splitting them in half, removing the seeds, and then cooking them in a mold made for like cakes with a bit of sugar and butter. And then you cook the apples super slowly, 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 maybe three, four hours. And the caramel penetrates the apple, the 
apple collapse on itself and they become this kind of like blonde caramel color and they are melting like butter. Maggie was living in Nice and she was my grandmother on my mother's side. And uh, Maggie would make every day when I was in the house an apple tart. And it would come out of the oven and I would smell it from the garden. And I would run inside the house and come in the kitchen and she would say, no, 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 wait, 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 it's too hot. It's not good for the stomach. I didn't listen. I would eat the entire tart. That tart was made for 12 people and I would eat it. <laughs> Every day. It's not, it was not like uh, once a week. It was every day. <laughs> I know that my, my family and my grandmothers show their love through cooking because it was the best way for them to express themselves, for me to understand. Because my passion for food was so big, it, they would give me great food. I would be like thinking great food means great love. Uh, so when I smell caramel and apple juice reducing together or when I smell also the dough cooking. Both uh, flavors really bring me back to, to home and Chez Jacques. To taste Eric Repair's cooking, enter for a chance to win dinner for two at his award-winning restaurant Le Bernardin. Simply visit livefromprincestreet.com and enter your email address. Then be sure to keep an eye in your inbox. The winner will be announced on Friday, May 27th. That's it for this month on Prince Street. Thanks for coming. If you were a food, what food would you be? Hmm. If I were a food, I would be a chicken. <laughs> Prince Street is produced by Elizabeth Robinson, Julian Plante, Andrew Chug, Fanny Cohen, Barry Finkel, Emily Rubin, and executive produced by Charles Finch. She's a, she's a, she's a crab. With special help from Whitney Donaldson and Ava Robinson. Maybe I'm a strawberry. I'd be a souffle chicken, because it's nice and crispy. And I'm your host, Howie Kahn. <laughs> Theme music by Dave Brubeck. That's it for this month on Prince Street. And be sure to come back next month. We'll be talking about craving with guests Mario Batali, Alex Guarnaschelli, and Scarlett Johansson. See you then. Prince Street is brought to you by Dean and DeLuca, purveyors of the finest food since 1977. With over 40 stores around the world, Dean & DeLuca curates the best ingredients for life.